you so much, Alison. I'm very happy to, to be uh, among you virtually today, and it's going to be a uh, pretty fun to uh, to. This is the first time that I do my a presentation in a in a virtual space like this. So uh, hopefully, it's going to be fun for um, for all of us, and it's going to work out. And uh, as Alison was saying, uh, uh, so my name is Celia, and I've, I have a PhD in psychology. So this is my training, and I've been working in the video game industry for the past. 15 years now, if you can believe it, um, I uh, started at Ubisoft in France, I'm French, and then I moved to Ubisoft Montreal, uh, and then I moved to LucasArts in San Francisco, I worked on a bunch of Star Wars games that sadly never saw the light of day because Star Wars, uh, uh, because LucasArts was closed down by Disney, and then I moved to Epic Games, and this is where I became the director of UX at Epic. Um, at the studio level. So I worked a lot on a lot of different projects. I worked on Unreal Engine. I worked on um, VR games. I worked on mobile games. And I worked also very closely on Fortnite. And I left Epic in uh, late 2017. And ever since then, I've been doing some uh, consulting work independently. So um, being exposed at, at Epic Games, uh, being uh, working at Epic Games exposed me to the metaverse very early on um, because uh, Epic CEO Tim Sweeney is, has been very vocal about the metaverse uh, already back in uh, 2015 or 2016 when I was there. He was already giving uh, talks about it. So this is something that has been in my mind uh, for quite some time and the, the UX challenges of what such metaverse will bring, especially if we think of a metaverse in a 3D environment, which is mostly what we're going to talk about today. And so, yeah, there's a lot of things going to be complicated to handle. Um, nothing impossible, of course, but uh, <laughs> it's important to think about how people are going to use the space and not just think about the technical challenges to create um, the space. And so that shift from being uh, engineer-centered or design-centered to um, being user-centered and human-centered is really what's the most important thing when, uh, when we think about UX. And um, the ultimate goal of, of user experience, human factor psychology and human factors engineering is to um, uh, improve people's lives with technology. And so it's not about just innovating and creating cool stuff. It's making sure that this cool stuff is really meaningful for people, that it's really solving their problems and that they can thrive in these environments. So this is the goal, not just, just making cool new stuff. All right, so if you can just follow me here, I have just a few slides uh, oh, that were there and they're not there anymore. <laughs> so I don't know, did I stop sharing? Um, Alison, do you know where the slides are? Are gone? I'll check the objects. Oh, it's there. Okay, where it's is there. this? Okay, so if you go into your objects um, uh, at the top right, Maybe just press that. You'll see the yep. second one is probably video, and you can maybe delete that if that doesn't work. Okay. Uh, delete. Okay. Sounds good. There we go. Okay. So now you should be able to do it. Okay. I'm going to share again. All right. Okay. There we go. I'll take it up there for you. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I have a few slides just to, to hop uh, visually. Um, I can't put it full screen because otherwise I can't see the space anymore. So it's complicated. Uh, so you don't have it full screen. I'm sorry about that. I hope it's, it's enough. Um, I just wanted to define the metaverse because a, a lot of people talk about the metaverse and there's a lot of different definitions um, around and it's fine because we're still trying to figure it out and what, what that means. Um, and so when I say metaverse, what I mean is, is to have a, a persistent virtual world. So a lot of time people are going to talk about a 3D environment. Uh, to me, it's not necessarily a 3D environment. You can be in a metaverse uh, and be in a 2D environment. And the, the metaverse is going to be persistent. Um, and so because of that, people are going to connect to the metaverse through different um, platforms. So people can enter the metaverse for maybe in VR uh, or through a computer but a lot of people are also going to join the metaverse on their phone. And sometimes you don't necessarily kind of need uh, a 3D environment to do stuff in the metaverse. And actually, it, having a 3D environment can make it things more complicated to navigate, as you might have experienced yourself um, in, this, in this environment, uh, to look at what are the different talks and where do you need to go. 
it's more complicated to actually physically have to move from one space to the other. Uh, it's complicated to tell everybody, hey, something isn't even happening. Um, you, you need to find ways for people to um, find shortcuts to go from point A to point B. Um, so it's not, again, it's not necessarily going to be in 3D. If, if it's in 3D, it has to have a reason for that. Um, the true metaverse needs to be decentralized and open source. Um, and so it means that just like uh, the internet, uh, the very beginning of the internet, everything was decentralized and, and you had um, lots of different um, uh, providers and you could go there and uh, navigate from one to the other. And there's a lot of UX challenges uh, from that. So I don't know if you followed, it's, I, I'm a big Twitter user uh, and because of the Elon Musk um, buyout, a lot of people are moving away from Twitter and using Mastodon. And Mastodon is a, a decentralized platform. And, and I see a lot of people confused about that because of course, when things are decentralized, it's more complicated for the user because then you have, depending on which instance you're cho choosing is going to be different rules and different um, set of uh, um, different environment and navigating from one or the other and understanding how it works is always more complicated for users. Um, so it's better to have a decentralized place to um, for democracy and for uh, free speech and, and for everyone participating, but it's also more complicated um, to make sure that the user is going to be able to navigate from one to the other and make sure that it's understandable um, and also that things are persistent from one space to the other. Um, so for example, if, if you buy something or you curate an avatar in one space, uh, this avatar should be persistent if you go to another space. So if, if you, in the metaverse, you should be able uh, to keep these elements, and we call we we um, we call inter we call that interoperability, and this is going to be also a, a complicated uh, element. Also, it needs to be immersive. So, in this immersive in the sense that you need to feel a sense of presence while you're there. So, in in psychology, most of the time when we talk about immersion, we mean um, um, sensorial immersion. So, for example, VR is going to be the, the most immersive platform because all your senses, like at least mostly your um, vision and audio, and sometimes also you have haptic feedback. So um, you have a lot of immersion of your senses in the world. Um, but what's actually more important is not necessarily to be immersed uh, with your senses, is to feel the sense of presence. Like for example, here, do you feel that you are in the space? Do you feel that your, your character in the world is really like you at a prolongation of, of yourself. And when you're navigating around, do you feel that you're just like pushing buttons on the keyboard? Uh, or do you feel that you are really moving around in the space? So the sense of presence is going to be really important uh, in the metaverse, making sure that the users really feel that they're present in, in this world. Um, and it's, a, it's going to be a space uh, filled with humans. It's not... Uh, that's the thing that's going to be important. You cannot have a metaverse without people. Uh, and it's also going to be important that we have active participation of people. Uh, so to me, one of the most advanced proto metaverse, because we do not have any metaverse right now, because right now it's not decentralized and it is, we don't have interoperability or we don't have any of that. Um, but you have some proto metaverses um, like Meta from Facebook or Fortnite. Uh, from Epic Games, but Roblox is um, more advanced in my opinion because you have much more active participation of the people in this space. So you have a lot of creativity, like people are not just there to consume, they're also there to create and to propose stuff to others and to gift and to share and to exchange. Um, so true metaverse space also is going to have um, really active participation from people. So I just wanted to make sure that this was clear. Um, and when we talk about UX, um, so if, if you're designing um, a, a space like a park, for example, if you stay just focused on the design of what you want to create, let's say that it's going to be less costly to have straight lines. And it's also, this is something that you want. Maybe aesthetically, you prefer straight lines. It's going to be much better for you. Um, but if you only think about what's, what you prefer, what's this aesthetically pleasing, um, and what's going to be less costly, you're going to miss out of what how users will want to um, use this space and what do they want. 
uh, what, what did they care about? And in that case, for example, so this is a real park in the UK, um, they don't care about the straight line that goes nowhere. They care about crossing at the crosswalk. And so most people are just going to go through the lawn. And then it's annoying because it's going to be costly to uh, maintain the lawn. And so no one's happy. Uh, the people who designed the park are not happy because the users are not using the park the way intended. Um, you do, users are not necessarily happy because, let's say, if it's raining now, they have to cross um, not on the pavement, and so their shoes are disgusting, and so they're not necessarily happy. Uh, and the city is not happy because they have to maintain uh, the lawn. And so when we think about that really last minute, we tend to patch things. Uh, we do that a lot in the game industry. We get a patch. Um, but if you think about this too late, those patches are really not going to solve the problem. It's just telling people, well, this is not the way you should be using the space. Like, please use the path provided. But p users don't care. Uh, users are going to do what they're going to do. And we should design this. The, again, we should design those spaces to solve uh, people's problems and to make sure that they're happy and they have uh, a good experience. And so to do that, we just need to shift from our own perspective as creators to adopt the perspective of the people um, who are going to use this space in, uh, in the end. And because an experience of anything, whether it is a park, the metaverse, or video games, is always happening in your mind. Um, what you see, what you hear, what you feel, all these things happen in your mind. And so an experience is not something that we can design per se. This is something that's going to be uh, felt um, by someone in their mind. And so we need to get to that um, uh, state of mind where we try to um, anticipate how our users are going to experience things. And, and so this is what UX is about. It's really considering human factors uh, when we create object system services or games. And so... Um, I'm just going to skip a few things. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick rundown of how the brain works. Uh, because since an experience is going to happen in people's minds and people's brains, so we need to understand a little bit how it works. And mostly uh, its main limitations so that we can prevent problems from happening and we can provide a better experience to users. So the, the, this is like a very simplified diagram of what's going on in the brain as you process information. Like right now, you're listening to me, you're in a space, there are slides, you're, what, you're looking at them, uh, you are processing this information. Um, so as, as that goes, it always starts with the perception of stimuli. For example, you hear my voice, so your, uh, uh, your, um, uh, your ears, you're perceiving, you're uh, sensing. Uh, all the all these sounds and you're making sense of it. And so perception is that is making sense of what's getting into um, with your the, the your sensory um, or your senses are getting from the environment. Um, so we have a lot of senses, not just the five that people always talk about. We, for example, have proprioception, which is a sense of your body in space. It's actually pretty important for VR. Uh, so we have a lot of senses that are uh, gathering information from inside our body, but also from, of, of course, the surrounding environment. And so we're going to then make sense of that. That's perception. Um, and then if you learn about something new, it means that it's going to change something physically in your brain. You don't memorize something without it leaving a trace somehow in your brain. So we have a lot of synapses. The brain is composed of, of uh, billions of neurons, and they're all connected to um, a, a lot, like up to 10,000 of other neurons. And these uh, connections are called synapses. Um, and these synapses are not fixed, fixed in time. You don't, um, it's not pre-wired uh, as you're born and you don't keep the same wiring in your brain the whole, your whole life. Uh, we have what we call brain plasticity. So your brain is, is really going to change depending on what you do, depending on the environment, depending if you train on a music instrument, this is going to really physically change your brain. Um, even like right now, listening to me and learning hopefully new stuff about uh, the brain and UX and, and all that is changing your brain. Um, and that's normal. This is how we, we can adjust to the environment. Like for example, uh, being able to, at, during the pandemic and the lockdown, uh, being able to immediately, like from one day to the next, change entirely the way we uh, communicate with people, the way we work, the way we socialize. Uh, we would not have been able to do that if our brain was not plastic. 
I'm not saying it was easy, um, but thanks to that plasticity that we have, we can adjust to the environment. And so between perception and change of memory, there's a lot of factors that are going to influence the, the quality of the, the information processing. And um, I'm not going to talk about everything, but your DNA has an impact on how you process information. Uh, your physio you, you have some physiological impact. If, if you've been listening to a lot of talks all day long, you might be tired now, and it's going to be higher, you know, harder to for you to process all the, the the new information coming. Or if you have too much to eat, or if you're stressed out, all of that is going to have an impact. But we are mostly going to talk about attention because we know that attention resources are really important to process information. So the more you pay attention to something, the better you're going to process the information, and therefore the better you're going to memorize it. So of course, this is extremely simplified. The brain is, is, doesn't have nice uh, independent buckets, as it's shown here. Uh, it really does not work that way. Um, everything interacts with each other, and we don't necessarily have specialized compartments like that. But um, I'm simplifying it here just for the sake of our own brains. And um, just for each of these elements, perception, memory, and attention, I'm going to give you uh, the main limitation that we have, because we, of course, we have lovely performances as humans, uh, but we also have a lot of limitations, and we are most of the time not aware of these limitations. It's important, whatever you create, to understand these limitations um, so that you can provide uh, a, the best experience possible. So, for example, uh, here, of course, like the answer is on the question, <laughs> which is not ideal. But if you if you look at this image, I usually ask people, you know, what do they see? Um, so I usually remove, actually, I'm going to do that so that you don't, uh, you're less uh, influenced by it. But I usually show this image to people and ask them, what do you, what do you think? What do you think that represents? Um, and without any prompts or anything. And, and I get a lot of different answers. So, for example, People in the game industry or people who love games or played a lot of Street Fighter immediately going to tell me, oh, yeah, these are Street Fighter characters. Uh, but then if you haven't played that game or you don't know that game very well, I get very different answers. Like People tell me flags or they tell me transistors. Um, sometimes I get DNA or um, what else do I get? Um, so, sometimes it just people say characters, but they you know, don't specifically recognize any uh, specific um, character. So the idea here is to understand that perception is subjective. Depending on who you are, depending on your past uh, knowledge on something, you are not going to perceive the same thing as someone else. Um, so your prior knowledge is going to influence the way you perceive things because perception is not a passive window to the world. We do not perceive the world as it is in reality. Perception is a construction of the brain. And so, again, your prior knowledge, um, the context, you know that I've been working in the game industry, so uh, you're more likely to recognize uh, video game characters than if I was working in, in um, uh, automobile, for example. Um, your DNA also has an impact on perception. If you're colorblind, which is the case of about 8% um, of the male population, you might feel excluded from this example. And it's a great way for me to remind everyone to never ever use colors on me to convey information. So perception is subjective. And it's not because for you, you're going to create assets, where it is audio, visual. Uh, it's not because you think it's going to be um, obvious. That's going to be obvious for everyone. So this is the first thing that's really important when we work in UX and human factors, is to, again, detach ourselves from our own perspectives on things, um, because this perspective is entirely subjective. And that's why we test um, things. Um, like in Fortnite, for example, we test uh, icons, and we tested icons and, and a lot of uh, uh, different elements to, ver to verify that people really perceive the things that we wanted to convey. Um, another thing that I wanted to tell you about is memory. So. Memory is wonderful. We can memorize a bunch of stuff, but we also forget a lot of elements. So for example, this is um, the forgetting curve that was um, researched first by Ending Us in the 19th century. It was also um, uh, reproduced in modern days. But the idea is if you have to learn about something, uh, so in this experiment, it was, it was done with non-meaningful material. So you, you just had to learn 
syllables that don't mean anything, but you learn like syllables, like a batch of batches of 10 syllables, for example, 20 syllables. Um, and then in the experiments, we vary the moment you have to recall them. So you learn them by heart, first of all. So you repeat, you, re you repeat up until you know them by heart. And then we vary the moment uh, when you have to say, you know, recite them again. If the recall is immediate, so it's right after you just learn them by heart, you have 100% good answers because you just learned them by heart so you can recite them all. But after only 19 minutes, the results drops down to 60%. So it means that you remember about 60% of the syllables that you learned, but the rest is already gone. And after a day, it drops down to nearly 30% of retention, meaning that from one day to the next, you might lose up to 70% of whatever you learned. So again, this was done with things that are not meaningful. Hopefully what I'm talking about to you today is meaningful. I'm going to remember more than 30% tomorrow. But still, we know that people are going to forget about stuff. So let's say you introduce them to a new space like the metaverse or whatever it is that you created. Um, and you're going to tell them how to navigate and where to find things. And it's not because you told them once. Then when they're going to come back the, uh, the next day or maybe they're going to come back much later, they're going to come back in a week. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that they would have forgotten. So memory is fallible, and we have a tendency to rely on people's memory too much. Um, that's why us, when we create things, when we uh, make me have meetings, you don't want to rely on your memory and your team uh, team workers' memory. We 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 write down stuff um, to make sure that we all agree on what what's going on and and what we need to do. Uh, if you rely too much on your memory, it's not going to go well for your the development of whatever you do, but also you don't want to rely on people's memories. So for the users, for the players in that case, uh, there's a bunch of things that we are gonna, we always going to give them as information. Like we're going to give them information on the HUD, the heads up display about how much material that they have, you know, what are their, the weapons currently equipped. And every time they're going to, be close to a searchable object. There's a pop-up in the UI telling them, hey, click, you know, press E to search. We don't want them to remember that. And if we don't ask them to remember that, they're not going to forget about it. Same thing in Fortnite. Crafting is very important. And so you open your inventory and you see all the things that you can craft. Maybe you're going to be excited about the exterminator. I'm going to craft that. Um, but we don't want players to have to remember what weapon they need to craft. What's the name of it? And what are the ingredients that they need to craft it? Um, so we provided, we created a, if an, a functionality uh, so that they could pin the, um, the, the, the recipe that they were interested in. And so it's on their HUD now, and they don't have to remember any of that. They just need to look at, okay, what's missing? Oh, I don't have copper ore. Okay, so that they can focus on their uh, objective, which is to find copper ore, and then they can, once they have it, uh, they don't have to remember how much they have missing, then they can craft. And that's really important when we make games. We, we think about what experience we want to offer to people, and where do we want to challenge them? Like in Fortnite, we do want to challenge them into finding the resources, um, into planning ahead, into thinking about what weapons they're going to need to go to the fight. We don't want to challenge them um, in terms of memory and what do they need to do. So that's going to be um, a very uh, important. I'm going to finish with the last part, and then I'm going to uh, let you uh, ask questions if you have some. Um, attention resources, like I said, is really important to process information. And the problem is that we are not good at it. We, we have the feeling that we can pay attention to everything at the same time. And we can um, spot things that are uh, really going to be relevant. It doesn't work like that. It's, it, that's the reason why games like Where's Waldo, Where's Wally, uh, or Shally, depending on where you are in the world, uh, is actually pretty difficult <laughs> to play. Um, that's because the, the attention system in, in the brain works like a filter. So we're not going to be able to scan everything like a, like, like a media uh, a computer would do, um, we're going to focus on one element or maybe two, but then the rest is going to be filtered out. And so whatever happens in these gray areas, we're not going to be able to pay attention. So if you're focused on one thing, but then something else happens over there, um, you're not going to be able to pay attention to that. 
even if it's in your field of view. So imagine in VR, uh, so we have a lot of problems already when we're not in VR and we can control the camera uh, to tell people, you know, what's going to happen. Um, but it's uh, attentional resources are really scarce. And we have to think about that when we create those spaces. So for example, in Fortnite, when we start the game, um, we place the player in a tunnel. So it's, it's fairly, and it's not super open. Uh, and that's on purpose so that players can really focus on what's going on here. So there are enemies that are popping. So the, the red circle is, this is coming from a, a play test video. So this is the eye tracking. We, we look at where people are looking at when they play. Um, and we also very on purpose add this little um, wall so that, so the enemies are here and we want players to be excited. So it's an action game. We, we don't want them to go through boring tutorials, uh, but we'll also do not want them to be overwhelmed as they just start the game and they have to discover all the things, which is draining attentional resources. Just like the first time, the first day at your new job, you're going to be drained because all the things, even though you understand how your job works overall because you've been hired, um, there's still a lot of new things you need to learn, like all these new faces and new names and uh, how does that work and what are your daily tasks? So same thing, even if you play a lot of games, the first time you're going to play a new game, you, there's a lot of things you need to learn. And so that's draining your attention resources and that makes you even more, even less likely to be able to pay attention to all the little details. So on purpose, we, we calm things down. Yes, there's going to be some exciting stuff. There's enemies popping, you need to kill them. Um, but you're in a protected area and there's nothing going to happen behind you or on the sides. Uh, there's only stuff happening in front of you. And even then you're protected because you have this wall that prevents enemies from getting to you. Um, and that's very much on purpose to pace, um, the player and, and the rhythm and to make sure there's not too much stuff happening at the same time. And here it's easier to do because we can control the camera. We can control... Uh, we, you know, we put some lighting also to draw attention to where the action is going on. In VR, we don't control the camera at all because the player, they, if they turn their head, they, they're going to look somewhere else. Uh, it's much harder to control that. And so in 3D spaces, when you're in VR, and on top of it, but even any 3D space, what's going to be really important is make sure you draw attention to where the things are happening so that users are not lost. And they're not going to a part that doesn't really mean something. Like, for example, when you had to join here, uh, were you able to find your way easily or were you getting lost because at some point you, you don't know what are the relevant um, elements in the, in the environment? Um, so that's the thing that I wanted to tell you about, like really to put the emphasis uh, on. And this is uh, um, cognitive science, so the, the science of mental processes. Um, like how attention and memory work um, is, is really the backbone of human factors and the backbone of UX. And remembering that perception is subjective, attention resources are scarce, and memory is fallible is really, really important in order to provide the, the best experience um, possible. So because of that, uh, we know that there's a lot of these limitations. And the problem is that the problem is not that we have these limitations, but the problem is that most of the time we don't realize that we do. Like we don't realize that perception is subjective. Um, I, I see a lot of people every, every now and then being very surprised on Twitter or recently on TikTok. Uh, there was a, where well, recently, it was probably a year ago now, there was a video that's, that was very viral. Uh, and we have a lot of these videos that become viral every now and then, they, it comes and goes. Um, but I don't know if you've, if you've heard of this one, but there was a video of, a TikToker, and I think it was a woman on the video, and she was pointing at the, at the top of the screen, and there was uh, two words, so one on the top left of the screen and another one on the top right. And there were two different words, and depending on what word you first read, um, you would not hear the same sound. So there was a sound playing at the same time, um, but depending on what word you were reading, you would not hear the same sound. And people were mind blown by that. And it's funny to see all the reaction of people saying, oh my God, like I heard this sound and, and, and then I did it again and then I heard another sound and my friend did not hear the same sound. It's amazing. No, it's like basic information in cognitive science that perception is subjective. 
Um, and so the problem is not that we have these limitations. The, the problem is that we're not aware of them. And so when we create spaces, we forget that perception is subjective, that uh, our memory is not good and, and, and attention and resources are, are, are scarce. And because we know what we're creating too well, we have what we call the curse of knowledge, it becomes, it becomes then very difficult to anticipate how new people are going to understand the space and, and use these elements. So do you have any questions so far uh, regarding kind of science and how we apply this knowledge to make um, better uh, environments? Hi. Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah. Hello. Uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. Just a quick question. You talk about yep. uh, looking at uh, what uh, the the player is looking uh, looking at. How do you mm -hmm. analyze the the data? Do you use it to restrain uh, all the choices to open it, and are you using just uh, punctually or um, uh, during the the work process? Um, so I'm not sure I understood the question. How we the, the eye draw attention? The, yeah. The eye tracking. Oh, uh, how do we use the eye tracking? Um, yes. So it really depends on the studios. Um, it, I. Biometrics in general are very costly to use. Uh, it takes a lot of time and a lot of resources. Um, so most of the time, uh, the way I used it in the past and uh, the way a lot of students are using it is just to help us understand where people observe. So we don't necessarily uh, gather data of uh, heat maps or where players look at, especially for complex games like Fortnite, because um, we, we need to combine all the data and because everybody's experience is going to be different, and it's really hard to draw conclusions. But it's helping us when we analyze, uh, like we look at videos and we ask users questions. Uh, so, for example, we're going to ask them, you know, what is this element? And we show them an element that they should have encountered in the game. And if they can't tell what it is, and then we look back and we see that maybe they looked at it or maybe they did not look at it, um, it's helping us to figure out is it because they didn't notice it because they were like too preoccupied doing something else? Did they, did their eye did not even um, gaze at this thing? But if it did, it doesn't mean that, let's say they did look at it. It doesn't mean that they really process the information. So it's more like anecdotal help um, when we observe uh, players playing and, and we ask them questions to help us figure out, is it because it's not standing out enough? Or is it because they don't really understand the meaning of it or it was not relevant for them? Um, so a lot, a lot of the studios right now do that, um, but it's, it's much easier, for example, if you have to analyze uh, an experience that everybody's gonna have the same experience, like let's say a video, everybody's watching the same video and they see the same thing at the same time, um, then for eye tracking, you, you might be able to congregate the data and, and see what would you know what are the elements that really stand out overall on average um, but for games like this it's, it, it can be more complicated uh, to generalize information because not everybody's going to see the same thing at the same time I hope that answers the question a bit yes thank you I, I was sorry I was, was wondering how you use it in VR uh, like for example Oh, in VR. So in VR. In VR too, like level design and graphic yeah. design, uh, if you are using it to uh, for designing the space and the experience by itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So absolutely. In VR, it's actually pretty important to understand where people are looking at. So we can either use it for information later on, you know, it was, was the thing standing out or not. Uh, but more, I mean, it's still very early in games like where... I wouldn't say that it's getting it's super advanced so far, uh, but now more and more studios and overall more companies are using um, eye tracking in VR to maybe wait until the player is looking at something to start an event, like to spawn an enemy or to uh, to display something. Uh, so we wait until the, the player or the user is looking at something more specifically so that we know they're ready to take on the information or they're looking at the, at the area that we want them to look at before we start an event. So yeah, that's very useful in VR to, to have eye tracking for sure. Okay, so um, the reason why I told you that is, is because when we talk about usability, 
uh, it's really about uh, ha we have these guidelines that that come from the understanding of the brain. And form follows function is going to be an important one. So it's coming from architecture. It's, it's the same idea of, as affordances, um, same concept. Um, but the reason why we use this, this term for, form follows function that's coming from architecture in games is because we use it a lot in level design. So I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but for example, the idea is, is we use that a lot for everything, for the icons, but also for character design. Like here um, in Mario, if you look at these, these characters, uh, just by looking at them, you can anticipate how they can be dangerous to you. Like the one on the top left, it's attached to the ground. It's a boulder attached to the ground. So if you're if you're not close to it, it's probably going to be not dangerous to you. Unlike this one, the skeleton, because it has something in their hand that they, it's a bone, and and so this one is probably dangerous to you from a distance. Um, this one is a tortoise. So and you know we we have a strong mental model for tortoises. They're usually very slow. Uh, in the real world, so we can expect that this enemy is going to be slow, whereas this one, some bullets, so is going to be probably very fast. And Bowser has spikes on its back, so it's probably not a good idea to jump on it because it's probably going to get hurt. Um, so that's form follows function. And we're thinking about how the shape of things are going to inform the functionality. Um, so that's an example for um, a character design. But if you look right behind you, uh, here we have um, the the level, like, you know, Mario level, uh, and this is the same idea, but for level design. So, it, it's a the the first Mario like level one one is very well known uh, for how to it, it's it's helping players learn about this environment. So, for example, it starts uh, the Mario stops here. It starts here, and you, Mario is very on the left of the screen. And then you see that the environment goes to the right. So naturally, the player knows that it's a side scroller, and they naturally are inclined, you know, to to go to the right. Um, we don't oops, we don't teach them anything about this. Um, they they just naturally understand that just because of the level design. And there's an enemy. Uh, let me use the the pointer here. Uh, okay, so Mario starts here, and then Mario starts to move around, and then you're going to have an enemy spawn here and going towards Mario. And so it's forcing Mario to jump, but there's, you know, there's, there's this little block that's blocking Mario. And so a lot of players are going to try to jump to either avoid the enemy, they don't necessarily know at that point that you need to jump on the enemies to uh, to kill them. And so either they're going to jump over it or try to jump on it to see what happens. And they're probably going to hit this little thing. And as they hit it, uh, they see that there's a bonus appearing. Uh, I don't actually remember what it was. Probably the, the little mushroom to, uh, to uh, go bigger. And so this is like what we refer a lot to Mario uh, Level 1-1 one, one in games because it's like really genius level design. It's really thinking about the architecture of the the game so that it's really going to um oops i didn't want to do that uh it's really going to help the player understand what they can do uh what are what's going on there without having tutorial text and just by how we place the players in this environment we help them understand what's going on it's like in fortnite like i i showed you um the the, the first level when the player starts in the cave um, it's really um, it's it's really helping players to understand where they need to go and focus on the right elements. Um, and and then we also try to think about how we can teach them about important stuff. Like for example, they start in the cave, they destroy the enemies, and then their weapon breaks. And then we teach them, well, you're breaking the web, your weapon is broken, and we can't fix weapons here. Uh, you need to craft a new weapon. And this is when we encourage players to um, try to find stuff in the world to uh, craft a new weapon. And so they explore the cave and they find material and they craft a new weapon. And as they do that, they're getting towards the end of the cave. And there's uh, they arrive at the end of the cave and there's open air and they can see the world of Fortnite out there, uh, but they can't get out yet because there's no they need to climb out and there's no way to climb out. And this is where we teach them to build stairs. So we always think about the 
space is not just as a cool place with a lot of stuff to do, but we always think about, okay, what's going to be meaningful for players to do at that point? What will they care about? And how we can arrange the space so that we can teach them what to do, uh, that we can create some need of learning a new skill, like learning how to build stairs, to uh, navigate this environment. And level 1-1 in Mario was really well done for that uh, because it teaches a lot to the player. And it's also exciting. Um, there's a lot of things happening. And it's just by thinking the environment and how the player is going to navigate um, this environment. We also think about how we can, again, form false function um, just in the um, how we place things, but also how we teach about um, what can they do, what cannot, they cannot do. So it's, we, call about, we call that signs and feedback. So for example, if you look at this element here, um, it's like a reproduction of, of a lot of games, like mobile games that you have um, when we have like different environments. Um, so hopefully it's, it's going to be clear for you here. But for example, we, we use a lot of mental models in real life um, and in what we use in video games. So if you're a gamer, you are going to be used at, by, at, at you're going to, you are familiar with certain codes uh, and how things work in a game. And so that you can apply it to another game. But we use a lot of stuff that's coming from real world. So, for example, if you look at this, um, a gamer might expect to be able to maybe hide here in, in these bushes. Because bushes in real life and in games are usually places where you can go through. There's no collision. Uh, you, you can really go through the bushes. And oftentimes, it's a place where you can hide. Um, so when we have bushes in games, uh, it can already give information to players that, okay, you're probably going to be able to hide. If you look at things like this, like this crate here, that looks metal. Um, so there's probably collision there, uh, and, but it's probably a good space to hide. So let's say that um, you have enemies here. You can probably, let's say there's my stuff here. You can probably be there. And if the enemies are shooting at you, the crate is probably going to protect you because it looks very sturdy. Whereas this one, this looks like, like a wooden crate. So probably if you're hiding behind the wooden crate and someone's shooting at you, Probably not a good idea because the crate probably is going to get dis destroyed uh, through the blast. So it's not only how we think the space and how we, um, not only the architecture of the space, but also all the elements, how we design them and, and what, um, what signs do we convey? What are the, the things that players understand from this environment? So just by looking at it, they can understand maybe what's, something they can interact with, what something's moving, not moving. If it's round, maybe it's going to move around. Um, if, it's, if it looks like a cube, it's probably not going to move around. Um, does it look like, like foliage? Can we hide in it or, or stuff like that? So it's, it's, we think a lot about that. And this is what we call form follows function. Um, and that has a big impact on how people can understand what they can do in the, in the environment. And as they interact in the environment, they understand what happens. Um, was there other stuff that I wanted to tell you about? Um, so that for usability, making sure that players understand, you know, the, the ability of using the, the game. So again, understanding the rules of the game, what they can do, uh, where, they, where they can go. Um, so that's going to be really important to um, onboard a game and to understand a game. But it's not enough. Like a game that is usable uh, is not necessarily fun. Um, so there's a whole, I'm not going to talk about that because it's not really the point of this presentation here. But there's also a whole thing that we, uh, that w w there's a lot of work around what I call engageability, how we can engage players and make sure they're having fun. So it's, it's a lot around motivation and make sure that, that they um, uh, are, there's something to do in the game and there are goals that are clear and, and can accomplish these goals, but it's also, they can feel competent in the game and they can also be creative and they can play with others. So feel relatedness. So like all, all uh, a lot of emphasis on emotion, like presence, sense of presence that we talked about a bit earlier um, and also game flow, like make sure that uh, the pacing of the game is good, etc. So there's a lot of stuff that I'm not necessarily going to um, talk about here because it's not really the, the point here. 
Um, but so this is how we can use cognitive science to help us when we create an environment, make sure that this environment is going to be usable, but also engaging. And for the metaverse, the first thing that we have to ask ourselves is not necessarily, you know, how cool it's going to look like and what's the, the cool new tools it can use and how innovative it can be. Uh, one of the first questions that we ask ourselves, we need to ask ourselves is how meaningful this is going to be for the users. And so like thinking about the engagement part and uh, why are people going to be motivated to use the space? Is, what is this going to bring them? Are they going to feel more competent if, if it's a space where you can accomplish a goal? Uh, is this really going to make it easier to accomplish this goal? Is it easier for you to navigate a conference when you are in a space where you have to navigate and you go physically from point A for, to point B? Or if you have a 2D space, you just click and you look at the list of the speakers and you just click on the, the speaker you want to go to. So these are the questions that are really important to ask ourselves when we think about 3D environments and in the metaverse, we, it's not about let's create the environment and make it 3D and make it um, like a, 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 a um, virtual world because we can. But is this going to be meaningful for, for uh, users? Is this going to bring something more than a 2D space is already bringing? So these are the questions we need to ask ourselves. And that's around engagement and around um, uh, meaningfulness. Is it meaningful? And this is the sort of, of discussion that I don't necessarily hear regarding the metaverse. You know, is it meaningful or not? Um, but there's another question. So if you come with me in the other room. Um, so there's another question. Um, not only we need to make sure the space is going to be meaningful. Uh, let me just think, check about what the video was about. Oh yeah, that's um, I should have shown you that before. Uh, so that's that's really showing um, how in a in a real game it's going to look like and how you can understand like you know what's where you can go and what you can do. Um, so it's just an, another illustration of that. Sorry, I think I forgot to show you that. Um, so when you think about the the metaverse, you first need to figure out you know why why does that matter. Why does that matter to users to go in a 3D environment to do things that could be done in, in 2D? Um, and on top of that, you also need to be inclusive. Um, so it's not because it's going to be cool that uh, <coughs> it's going to be easy for everyone to navigate. Uh, an environment in 3D where you, where you need to navigate with uh, WASD and, and a mouse is going to be necessarily more complicated to navigate for people with disabilities. Um, so we need to think about all these things um, because if you, if you just create stuff to make it look cool and, and, and just to create some, some new innovative tools, um, this is not necessarily going to solve any problems for the users. And it's, it's actually going to make it less inclusive um, because it's, it's more difficult to navigate. And so we need to think about all that. We first need to think about why is this going to be meaningful? And also how we can make it more inclusive um, and how we can make sure, I just wanted to show you this, go all the way there, I don't care about this. Okay, um, making sure that people can uh, access via multiple platforms. Yes, they can access v with VR, maybe this is gonna be the best experience possible, but maybe they don't have a VR headset or maybe they cannot use a VR headset. So. Is, is their um, experience going to be as interesting if they connect through mobile or through PC? We need to, if we want a true metaverse that's going to be decentralized and um, inclusive and accessible to everyone, we also think need to think about culturalization. Uh, because symbols that we use in a country or in a territory is not necessarily going to be as meaningful for another uh, territory. Sometimes it can be also... Um, uh, um, what's the term? Um, and, um, ah, shoot. <laughs> it's a morning here for me, and so I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting some of my words. Uh, it could be offensive. There you go. Uh, for, for other people. And another very important thing we need to solve is um, making sure people are safe. And so <clears throat> in, in 2D, it's already very complicated. We have a lot of problems in games, for example. 
um, where people are harassing each other. Um, you have you hear racial slurs. Uh, you hear people trolling in the chat. Um, it's all it's a big big issue that it's really not easy to solve. And anyone who wants wants to take over a social platform will very easily and fast you know and very soon realize that it's actually pretty difficult to tackle. Although the bots and the trolls uh, have to navigate that. But in a 3D space, you also, it's like physically, the, the physical closeness is even more difficult to, to tackle. So it, it's already difficult in 2D, uh, in just chat environment and social spaces, and any social space we're going to have um, to deal with disruptive behavior and to protect people from harassment and, and racism and sexism. But when you're in a 3D space where people can really be close to one another, um, if you have the, the, the sense of presence, if you feel physically present, if you feel that now I'm really going close to you and you feel that I'm, 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 I'm coming through you and you feel that physical closeness, so it means that you feel that physical presence. Well, that means that harassment is going to be even more difficult to tackle um, because it's, it's much easier to make people uncomfortable because I'm entering their space. And, and so the managing the, the, the space bubble of people is something that a lot of people are working on, uh, but it's still very complicated, as you can see in this collage here of, of a lot of um, news. Um, it, it's getting really difficult. Um, and of course, not having <laughs> anything below the waist can help, um, but this is also not peop what people want to expect. So thinking about safe space bubbles uh, or a way to disconnect, it, it, we have to think about these tools. But right now, we don't have great tools for that. And because if you're not tech savvy and you're not ready, you might feel harassed very quickly in those spaces. So all of that is going to be very important to understand um, and to solve for if we want to have usable, engaging uh, 3D environments and, and metaverses, uh, and also safe spaces. So that's all that I wanted to tell you about um, today. And uh, so thank you so much for being here. And I know that we have time for questions because it's the last um, I talk of the day. So that's why I'm allowed, I'm allowed myself to talk a little bit more. And I see that Jean-Louis has his uh, 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 hand raised. So yeah, what's your question? Hello, thank you for your presentation. Very interesting. I have a question, yes, because um, it's nice to hear you address some social questions, mm -hmm. uh, behavior questions in these um, environments, virtual environments. I have a quite critical question because uh, first time I met, can meet something, some body, sorry. <laughs> not the thing, it's, uh, it's a body, it's not an, only an avatar. It's an <laughs> yeah. you, you worked at um, Epic Games. <coughs> and um, my experience of this company is uh, one of the father with the child who uh, played a lot of Fortnite and, and the first years of Fortnite and became a victim. And I want to know if you could be could give some insight about the strategies of the such companies for making the players addictive to the game on how you do do you um, deal with it it's not an aggressive question to you yeah yeah <laughs> it's an aggressive question to this company because we we may know that they are not innocent in this Questions. What do we do you think of this? Yeah. So there. So uh, let me actually have a slide on this. I think. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so <clears throat> there are two things to consider. Uh, you mentioned the term addiction. Yes. Uh, this is a, this is a different story. Uh, when you hear uh, people in the media talking about uh, addiction to games, you have to be careful because addiction is uh, has a clinical definition. And most of the time, this is not what we see. Uh, truly, people who are truly addicted to something is a really small percentage uh, when we talk about games. And how we define addiction to games uh, is still highly debated. And uh, a lot of scholars do not agree 
with the with the definition. They do not agree with a um, a World Health Organization that created a, the, this um, gaming disorder um, as you know like a, a, a new addiction that we need to look into. So that's the first thing to understand. Uh, when people say addiction, they mostly mean that they're super engaged and they want to come back, but it's not a true addiction in the clinical sense of the term. Um, we, had a, we had a clinical case. What's that? We had a, clini we had a clinical case. So I, I'm not a clinician myself. And, and there's, uh, again, know. there's a lot. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of debate around that because... Uh, yeah, what are the criteria to define that someone is addicted to games is are not clear right now. I'm not going to get into that debate because I'm not competent for that, but I'm just pointing out that um, the, uh, the use of the term is abused right now. Now, that being said, uh, so we, we're not, no one has created anything to addict someone, uh, definitely, and, they, and, and addiction is, is not just an object that is going to create an addiction. Uh, if you talk to an addiction specialist, they talk about an interaction between three elements. So the object of the addiction, so it could be alcohol, most of the time is it's actually a substance, so drugs, alcohol, etc. But let's say we put video games in there. Uh, but then it's not just that. It's going to be a personality. So some people have uh, different uh, personality traits that are going to make them more likely uh, to um, have an, 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 an addiction in their lives. And the third element is the context. Of, you are more likely to fall for an addiction if you have depression, anxiety, or you're suffering for a, from a loss or something like that. So the, uh, the object itself cannot by itself create an addiction. Uh, so that aside, and again, I'm not a specialist in that, uh, what the... Um, the companies are uh, responsible of is how much engagement they create and how much this engagement is fair or how much it is uh, using uh, the the limitations of the brain and the biases that we have to create this engagement. So this is what we call um, dark patterns or like shady practices. Um, let me show you an example. Um, so for example, in, in, let's say you buy something on a platform and you don't realize, you know, you put stuff on your cart and then you, you want to check out. And so you click on check out and then you see this big screen, um, get started and you, we don't read because attention and resources are scarce. So we're just going to click on the big orange button. But if you do that, you don't only get started into checking out, but you also sign up for a subscription without realizing it. If you don't want to sign up, you just want to check out, and you need to actually click on something that's smaller, it's not clear. So this is what we call the dark pattern. This is when um, the, the intention, and this is really against UX principles, because like I said earlier, UX is about um, making um, people's lives um, better with just, we want to improve people's lives with technology. And here the goal is, is to make the business goals better <laughs> with, uh, by using tricks to make people subscribe to something they don't necessarily want to do. So that's a dark pattern. And now you also have things that are close to dark patterns, but it's not completely deceiving. Uh, it's just using some tricks to make you want to come back. Uh, but it's not necessarily completely deceiving. So that's why it's not clearly a dark pattern, but I call that a gray area. So for example, this is to use um, guilt tripping. Like if you have no more lives or if you don't buy something, you see a character crying. Or if you don't come back at some point, your crops are going to die and then uh, you're going to lose all the, of your progress. So this is capitalizing on what we call loss of version. Um, or if you use loot boxes, uh, which is, is like randomized um, uh, bonus. And we know that this, this is usually more engaging. So all these things like guilt tripping, um, if, if, you know, if something's crying and you have to pay to remove the discomfort or losing loot boxes um, and you have to pay for them, this is a, like, just like gambling. Uh, this is a way to engage people with m more with the monetization rather than more with the game. Or <clears throat> if you tell them, well, if you're not here, there's a comet that's going to fall off. And if you're not here at that moment, um, then you're going to miss out on something amazing. 
or if you don't play enough during the season, like if you want to have the amazing um, uh, reward at the end of the season, you have to play every day or you have to accumulate enough points to be able to have this, this thing. This is capitalizing on what you call the fear of missing out. Uh, lots of version I, I mentioned it earlier. If you don't come back, you're going to lose your progress, you lose your crops. Um, so all of that are tricks that can be used by some uh, companies or some uh, game studios to um, influence players to come back and to be there because otherwise, again, they're going to miss out on something. And and the, I'm not again, this is not going to create an addiction, but that's definitely going to create some engagement that is not necessarily um, um, that is not. Um, can I say it's not it's not ethical because it's not because they are they care about the, the game and they care about playing with their with their friends that they're gonna come back. They're gonna come back because if they don't, they're gonna miss out on something or they're gonna lose uh, their progression. And this is a fine line um, where definitely the game industry needs to focus on, and that's the reason why I don't know if I have it here. Um, I I started an initiative called um, it's not there. Um, um, ethical games, where we think we try to think about where is the line, where are the ethical lines that sh we should not cross, so that players, yes, they can be engaged. We want players to be engaged with the game. There's no point in playing a game if you're not engaged with the game. You, there's like just like there's no point in watching a movie or TV series if if you don't want to come back and see what's going to happen. So we want to create that engagement for sure, because otherwise it's not entertainment. Um, but we don't want to have like those uh, artificial uh, pressures that are put on players, especially young players, so that they they feel they need to come back, otherwise they miss out on something, or they're they're not cool, or they're they're gonna lose something. So I hope that helps a little bit. Um, but we have to move away from the 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 uh, using the term addiction because it's not really useful. Because the, the game industry is definitely not creating an addiction. And by saying this, and, and it makes it difficult to talk about the real problems that are those, you know, the use of dark patterns and, and shady practices that definitely should get better. Yes. Does thank that you. help a little bit? Yes, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> oh, thanks, Alison. Alison put um, the ethical games yeah. uh, link in the chat. Everyone should really check that out. I think I, I really love this question, this last moment here, because indeed, um, I also find that, um, you know, there, it, the terminology is terminology is so important. And also understanding, you know, what is the root cause of it, and, you know, being able to distinguish the two. And I really appreciate Celia's work as well, because, you know, trying to push forward and trying to create, like, standards <laughs> um, yeah. for this. And it's quite it's quite quite tricky because it doesn't necessarily um, always align with commercial interests. So you know that boundary. Um, I'm I'm actually curious, Celia, um, with the boundary of, you know, obviously you want to have a, the user to have a good um, user experience, but usually commercially also there's other intentions. So how do you navigate mm. that? Yeah. So, so on the long term, it's it's always. Uh, we, you build trust with when you're a company and, and you provide something. You build trust with your with your users and your customers. So on the long term, uh, you actually want to be aligned and you want to have a UX strategy um, because the idea of if we are human centered. So I, I just pull out the the, the four pillars here of um, of uh, UX. We are human centered, so we center around the human that are going to use the product, not around what we care, or what we found pleasing. We care about the people who are going to use the, the environment. Uh, it's grounded in science, not grounded in, it's not our opinions. Everybody's going to have their opinions, and that's fine. Like we are humans, we're going to have opinions, but we treat opinions are, as a hypothesis so we can figure out you know, what's really going on. It's a collaborative process. Everybody is uh, responsible for the experience that the end user is going to have. It's not just people with UX in their title. And the last part is it's benevolent. So it's the most important part. Again, what we want is to improve people's lives with technology. Um, and when we have a UX strategy, we believe that's a win-win for the users and for the business. It's a win for the users because their license is made easier or they're having fun uh, with some entertainment product. And it's a win for the business because if the users are happy, then they're going to come back and they're going to tell their friends and then maybe going to buy more. 
And so that's good for the business. But we do want to have this win-win balance. Of course, we need to make money. Um, so it's, it's always a better win for people if they never pay for anything and everything's free. But realistically, it's not possible. Like people who work on creating stuff need to be paid. Um, so there's always going to be some friction somehow for the users. And they are constrained. You know, we cannot make the perfect environment because we need to ship <laughs> the product uh, in, I don't know, in two years. And we don't have infinite money and we don't have infinite people. There's, so there's always going to have, con we have constraints around that so that we can not only um, make the people happy, but also um, make money and we can uh, survive. Now, we lose that balance where when we focus too much on the business goals and we want to make money faster or by using tricks because we trick people into subscribing to something they didn't want to subscribe. And then, then we know that there's another um, bias. It's called the, the status quo bias. Like people, when, if they have to do something to unsubscribe, most of the time they're not going to do that. Um, so when we abuse of that, uh, we put the business forward and now it's, it's more win for the business and it's and more lose for the user. That can work in short term. That's why dark patterns work because in short term, in short term, like people fall for these and they don't necessarily what's, know what's going on or uh, because they don't necessarily have another option. That's also when you have um, um, a, um, a company that is super big and, and now uh, is, is centralizing everything, it's getting harder to get out of it because you don't have a better alternative. And so you suck it up. You know that, okay, they're, they're using dark patterns or whatever, um, but you don't have a better option or for you it's going to be more complicated to uh, find another provider. Um, so that can work on the short term. But uh, and definitely, you see some companies that, are, that have been tr thriving and making money uh, out of that. But I don't believe that's going to work out forever because the companies that are that are you know billion dollar companies today did not exist ten years ago, and they probably are not going to exist in ten years. Um, new companies are going to uh, rise up, and people are more informed today. Uh, and and I'm among the people who want. The public to be informed about these these shady practices so that we can actually um, uh, favor the companies that are more ethical and that are really uh, are human centered instead of being business centered and and so in the long term I don't think it's a it's a good strategy um, because you can build trust if people realize that you've been deceiving and uh, tricking them so that's the the it's a long story short. I, I know it's a, a bit of a long uh, explanation for that. But I think in the short term, a lot of people look at that short term and medium term. Yeah, yeah, you can thrive on dark patterns and shady practices. But if you really want to build trust and be there in 10 years, I don't think it's a good strategy. Okay, thank you so, so much, Celia. And thank you for everyone as well. Um, you know, this has been super, super interesting. A lot of information too, which is amazing. Um, and um, I, I guess if anyone else wants to discuss things more, we can go back to the hub space. Um, but um, I just want to extend a round of applause for Celia and her, um, her presentation on this and this kind of very important topic that's often like overlooked in some ways and but it's a really important part of um, designing spaces um, that are meaningful and um, are user friendly because um, as we enter this realm it's going to be more and more important that we we have more people considering and, and really putting this first so thank you yeah yeah thank you thanks for having me and yeah thank you, thank um, you. they need to be inclusive and ethical <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna hang out also in the in the